here. And great, let's get started. So first I'd like to introduce our speaker, Joel Gottlieb. Joel joined D-Wave back in January of 2016 as a senior pre-sales analyst after 20 years in AT&T and AT&T research. He earned his PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Madison in condensed matter physics after graduating from the University of Michigan. At D-Wave, his role includes bringing new users to the quantum computer and researching basic problems which show the power of the system. He loves learning new subjects and new technology and also enjoys talking music. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joel and we can start. Yeah, thanks, Susan. And put it in slideshow mode, please. Yeah, and I don't know what happened to me here. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you so, sound fine. Thanks. So, um, yes, welcome to What's in Your Knapsack, the hybrid solver service. And a special hello today to everyone else and I think that's essentially the whole world who's out there sort of stuck at home. Um, working from there, it is necessary for you and me and everyone to be safe. So just uh, we're all in this together. What's in your knapsack? The hybrid solver service. And what I want to tell you about is some new work that D-Wave released uh, about a month ago, um, which um, is interesting and uh, adds to our portfolio of tools that you can use for your quantum computer problems. And um, at the end, we'll say a little bit about uh, some very, very new stuff for COVID-19. So, all right. Um, our agenda will be that uh, we're gonna introduce the hybrid solver service first. We're gonna look at two problems, um, graph partitioning on a clique, and then the knapsack, and uh, hence the title, and then we'll conclude. Um, and if some of this goes over your head, um, please don't give up on it. Um, there's material on YouTube, and uh, as Susan just mentioned, we have people answering questions. If you've got questions, probably someone else does too, so don't hesitate to ask them. This material takes some getting used to, and we know that and uh, we, we know people need help and we like to do that. That's, that's part of what we do. So the first thing is that the LEAP Hybrid Solver Service uh, introduced about a month ago now. The idea was to ex way expand the problem size and offer a solver um, that would handle much, much bigger problems than were previously possible. If you have history with the D-Wave QPU, the quantum processing unit, then you know that you had to worry about where the qubits were located, whether your problem would fit on the graph and so on. And the hybrid solver service makes it much easier to solve much bigger problems without knowing anything about that. Um, and so I'll go down some, some uh, attributes of it here. The idea is, be able to run problems up to 10,000 variables, um, a much bigger problem than we had previously offered. Um, those problems are gonna run on basically a portfolio solver, uh, which offers classical and quantum computing resources. Um, you know from other webinars and our literature that sometimes on problems like the traveling salesman, there's classical things out there that are really good, and the quantum computer does not necessarily compete very well with them. But the idea behind a portfolio is that you want to use some of those classical tools in tandem with the quantum computer to come up with something to get a solution more often than previously. It's easily accessed in the Leap user interface. I'll show you that later. Um, it has a short learning curve. It's, it's really designed to get you started quickly. And you're gonna purchase, uh, if you wanna sign up for some time, and it, instead of the one minute free per month, then you'll be purchasing increments of leap access instead of solver time. And you'll have access to both the hybrid solver and the uh, quantum processing unit. So. 
let's continue. The portfolio approach, the idea is that it's, as I mentioned, it's a quantum classical merge, if you will. A hybrid is the better word for it. Um, the hybrid solvers are to be used in parallel in different ways. And basically to be able to target different types of problems that have been researched. And what happens is that when a problem comes in, there's a front end that chooses one of the hybrid solvers and starts the problem in parallel on uh, the CPUs and GPUs that we have in, you know, like NVIDIA, GPUs that we've involved. And each heuristic solver formulates some number of quantum queries, which are sent to the QPU. And so those solvers basically are utilizing the QPU to get their work done. And in each solver, it's asynchronous so that there isn't blocking. In other words, um, increase the likelihood that you're gonna get multiple solutions back and the portfolio front end is gonna make a choice of the best one. So just a brief amount of data here, which I'm not gonna go too deep into, but some problems that were studied with the hybrid approach, uh, the blue curve is uh, showing with the hybrid workflow and the red is without it. And the left problems are denser problems where you have a lot more qubit connectivity needed in the graph. The right problems are more sparse. And uh, in both cases though, we, we showed gains in solution quality. Again, I'm not going through this in detail. There's a white paper that, uh, that we have on our website that has a little bit more detail on these curves. There's only one user parameter. So one of the things briefly to mention is that we know that the solver isn't easy to use. It's a problem everybody faces when you're using something brand new. You have to figure out all the little bells and whistles and, and how you want to use them. And in this case, it's a time limit in units of seconds that you can put on the problem. And the system calculates a minimum time limit that scales with input problem size. And what that time limit does is it ensures that the hybrid solver has enough time to do at least the first step in its own uh, classical approach, whatever that is, and also to query and have a good chance to get an answer back from the D-Wave quantum computing unit, you know, which, which needs quantum processing unit, QPU, excuse me. Um, so the minimum time limit for all problems is three seconds and the longest is 24 hours. So this is really designed for bigger problems, basically, and things where you, you want to sit it and set it going and let it run for a while. And I'll show you one of those later. Uh, in this talk. Uh, at the end of the time limit, once that time limit takes effect, the solvers stop and the best solution is sent back. And basically the idea is the user doesn't have to decide which solution approach is best. And just to allude, uh, allude to something here, you might remember months ago that there was a talk on D-Wave Hybrid, which is a framework for uh, hybrid solving problems. That is a different thing. And if this doesn't work out, there's also the possibility of using D-Wave Hybrid to basically set up your own approach to a problem using different hybrid solvers. So this is more of an all-in-one approach, hoping that it's gonna work well, but if it doesn't, there are other options that we have. There's a, um, a YouTube video on that as well. It was a webinar last fall. So let's look at the first problem, which is um, going to be very familiar to some of you who have seen us do this repeatedly, but it's because it's a good problem, so you want to do it again. If you don't know what a clique is yet, C-L-I-Q-U-E, I'm going to show you. And the applications are in um, uh, gossip social networks. Basically, to, to look at these two pictures, you have really dense things like those green things on the left, the, uh, the VLSI, um, the circuit integration on chips. Notice that on, on those bars of green there, there's lots and lots of hardware. And then the links to the other parts are not very dense. Hopefully you can see that. And, and there's a bus on the left and so on, but 
part of the reason you do that is you don't want to necessarily pay the cost. It's going to be slower across those links in this particular case. On the right, you might have these clouds of activity where these people are very intricately connected. And then you might want to minimize or maximize the connections to the other clouds. And um, I can't help it, but maybe this kind of modeling will actually help with COVID-19 modeling at some point, which I'll mention in the end, because actually this is sort of what we're doing between houses right now socially. You don't really want the interactions. You can't help it inside a house. But between houses and, and socially, you want to reduce the risk of, 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 of um, interacting with others who have the illness. So here's the problem. You have a graph. This is a really small example of one, but I'll show you one in a minute. Split the graph into two subsets so that they're the same size and you have as few edges as possible between the subsets. Okay, so zero and one here are a subset and three and two are. And then in this case, they have uh, one, two, three, four links in between. And um, this is also called a clique, C-L-I-Q-U-E, or full mesh, another example of something where any one of the uh, elements, in this case you can call them nodes or objects, whatever, is connected to all the others. It has a way to get to the others. So here's one with 10. And um, you can see on the picture that, all right, I want two equal partitions, so everybody knows that's going to be five. And how am I going to do that? How am I going to chop these up so that um, there's as few links as possible between the five, okay? Excuse me, that is one group of five and the other group of five. So how many nodes in each partition do we hope to get? And how many connections between the partitions? And here's an example solution where it was uh, for n equals 10. And obviously this is not difficult stuff, it's five. Um, five on the right in yellow uh, or orange, whatever, however you see that color, <laughs> and white is five. And uh, how, many how many connections are there? It turns out that if you do this on a clique, the answer is going to have take half of the n, take half of 10, and that's five, and square it. And you get 25. And briefly, the reason for that is that each one of those yellow ones has to be connected to the others on the other side. So they've got to go to all five white, and then each yellow goes to five. So five times five is 25. And so we'll be looking for that in our solutions when we send this to, a, uh, to the uh, hybrid solver service. How do I get this solution? In other words, I just showed you a solution, but I didn't say how I got it. And the way I got it is that I formulated a Cubo uh, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. That's mathematical representation of the problem, which we wrote out. I wrote a Python program using the o Ocean API, which implemented it. We ran the Python program on a sampler solver, either way. And then we visualized it using the recently released D-Wave Problem Inspector. So that's another secret motivation behind this talk is to show you the Problem Inspector, which, which you're going to get a look at here coming up. All right. I had to put this in here. This isn't a math talk, but um, uh, basically the top line in the math there is the general cubo for graph partitioning. And then if you simplify it down to where it's a clique, where all of them can reach all of the others, then it gets into a little more of a simplified form on the bottom line. And it looks a lot worse than it is. I encourage anyone who's out there that's saying, gosh, I don't have the math skills to understand that. If we had some time, we would be able to explain this and talk this through, because it's counting is a lot of it. It's just a little bit of notation and counting. So we run the problem. What we're going to do in this talk is we're going to run the problem first on the QPU to understand its behavior. And we expect that the energy of the solution 
is, as I mentioned, half of the n squared. I expect that the ground state solution will successfully have a number of zeros and ones that are even, in other words, equal size graph partitions. And I expect that I'll have no chain breaks. Now, this talk does not go into this, but you might remember my embedding one, which was a couple months ago. We talked about it that if the chain strength isn't enough, then the embedding of the problem, excuse me, onto the D-Wave uh, chips graph can lead to problems. But this talk, partly because we're gonna do the hybrid solver, you don't have to worry about the uh, chain breaks. I'm just mentioning it since we're running on the uh, QPU. So first, I'll show you some code. Uh, this is not a complete program, but it's part of a program that uh, we use to run on the QPU. And at the start, you have your imports. Notice the D-Wave sampler and the fixed embedding composite. Then we go on and we, we basically set up the D-Wave sampler so that I can call it. And I find an embedding uh, hidden in there is a tool. It's, it's uh, called Minor Minor. I didn't show it, that's part of Ocean. We find an embedding, we send it to the uh, something called the fixed embedding composite, which uh, works together with the sampler. And then we run the, in the, the line there, sampler.sample, sends it to the quantum processing unit with a chain strength given by a number up above and a thousand reads. And hopefully you've seen this before. What happens? What happens is that, first of all, we can't get very big because this is one of the things that we can't do on the QPU. We can't embed. Now, I wanted to do it for n equals 10, 20, 40, 60. And you can see in the second column there that embedding it requires more and more qubits. The current product is the D-Wave 2000Q. And we're using more than half of them at, uh, at n equals 60. So it's going to be a pretty big, big graph over the, uh, over the chip. The chain length gets up to 32. And if you've seen some of our previous talks, that's not real good. It's just a really long chain. One thing, though, that does happen is that you do get the correct number in that last column there, the number of links between partitions. And notice, again, I'll remind you that uh, Take 60 divided by 2, get 30 squared, 900. So to me, this is always a good check on, is my problem working right? Am I getting the right answer? You know, in, in physics, we would say, is the energy right? Is the solution right? It's just a way to check that we're at least on the right track. The chain's got long. All right. We can't go beyond 65 on a clique on the D-Wave 2000Q. Little plug, we're going to release a new chip later this year, uh, the Advantage system, where we hope that number uh, will go up to about 180, I believe. And it's not that we hope that that number, it is going to go up there. I'm just hoping for a release of it soon. Now, let's now make the code changes for the Hybrid Solver Service, HSS. And one point is, it's easy to use. I'm going to import the leap hybrid sampler. I'm going to uh, call it with a time limit of three. Basically, I'm going to instantiate it as the right word and get the sampler with three seconds time limit there. And then I'll basically do sampler sample. And another plug here for the people, our software group that designed this architecture for software a couple years ago when this popped up, that the new thing here, this HSS, fit right into it, which kind of indicates just a little plug there for their forethought on how this was designed, that it, it fit right in. That's pretty cool that an API held up that well a couple years out. I was here, I remember that, and, it, and it's holding up beautifully. There's no embedding to worry about. There's no number of reads. There's no chain strength. And um, this is nice. So what happens? Let's run it, and we're, this time we're going to crank up N a lot bigger. And uh, so let's talk through the results here. On the left column is N, and you'll notice that I got up to 3,200 for N. 
And that is a big graph. I'm not gonna try to draw the picture of it, but you can picture that each of those has to be able, each one of those 3,200 has to be able to contact all the other ones, has to have a link to it. So that's gonna be a dense looking clique. The minimum time that I use there, you'll see the threes. See how it goes up to five and then eight in the second column there? That's because the software tells me when I submit the problem, nope, minimum, chain, uh, mi minimum time isn't enough, up it. And you do. You know, you go up, it tells you actually, increase it a little more and this is enough. And so eight seconds was good enough there to run the 3200. And notice in column three, that's again that the answer uh, that I was expecting, showing that the one way to show that the answer is right, um, 2.56 million links between the, um, the uh, partition and the other partition. And again, just referring back to that, it makes sense because half of 3,200 is 1,600. And um, you've got to, each one of those has to get to the others when you square it, 2.56 million. The next columns are showing you the runtime. Um, the charge time, the, the fifth column, is what you would be billed for as a user. And it's more or less the same here. Um, the QPU access time is how much time the QPU used was used by the hybrid solvers. And it looks like not a full second. These are in milliseconds, I mean, uh, microseconds. So then finally on the right, I did something interesting was to compare to simulated annealing, which is a classical solution method. And you can see that something interesting happens for very small n, the simulated annealing solver does better, it's faster and it comes up, but you can see what happens there in the lower bottom right, nah, -uh, it is not gonna compete when n, get, when n gets very large. So this is part of what hybrid solver is good at. It, it's gonna be better and better with these really big problems. And uh, just a couple extra notes. Um, the, as I mentioned, the links between them are good. We had to increase the time, but we forgot something. And what we forgot is that D-Wave software team realized that if a user is gonna input a huge problem involving millions of connections between qubits, that's gonna require something faster. And so they released some software, and I'm gonna, uh, gonna point here to the second line, vector BQM. You might be familiar with binary quadratic model. Um, in this case, we're gonna use this edge vector BQM, which is more optimized to handle a much larger problem. In other words, it has to read it in parts and it's smart enough to be able to do that. And um, you hit you, the third line there is just that I'm using the ability to put in a constant in the problem so that I can end up checking the solution more easily. You don't have to do that. Um, and again, just providing references there to um, our previous videos. But what happens here when I go up uh, as big as I can? Um, factors of two, going up to 12,800 isn't possible. As I mentioned at the start, it, it, cut, it uh, caps out at 10,000. So I thought this was pretty cool that uh, 40 seconds and you get an answer and, and it looks right. And, and um, the number of links between the partitions is getting really big though that 2499001, let me just go over that, 24 million, um, starting to get to be a big number. Now, I, um, I, when I finished this particular problem, I bounced it off of one of our uh, benchmarking experts, and she said, ha, huh, that's one of the easiest problems that there could be for a... Uh, a, a solver like this for a, for a heuristic solver. So what she called it was the simplest possible basic problem. Um, but I thought it was cool anyway, 
that I can run something this big and get an answer that fast. The QPU participates. The uh, hybrid solver utilizes all the time that you give it, the, you know, whatever that input time is. Um, it just turns out this one's easy because um, there's lots and lots of ways to partition those graphs when they're cliques. And she pointed out to me, try it with a non, you know, on a non clique, like a random graph. And that's something for another talk. But uh, then it's a lot harder uh, to know what that answer is. All right, let's talk about the knapsack. So this was from, I don't know, a few weeks ago, maybe. Uh, I thought it was New York Times when I first saw it, but I keep Yahoo open each day. And so I get links like this and like, wow, somebody, somebody was talking about the knapsack problem um, and how it's used everywhere. Here's this, the problem we wanna solve is you have a backpack or a shipping container or something and you wanna put a collection of objects in it and each object has a weight WI and a value VI. And what the value means is that I wanna maximize the total value in the container. In other words, the sum of the Vs should be as high as I can get it, but I'm only allowed to pack in up to a maximum weight W or, or it isn't gonna go. So this is definitely a relevant industrial problem as well as a personal one. We've all experienced it. You're trying to stuff the books into your backpack there in the bottom or whatever it is, and there's only so much stuff that you can take. And so you sort of make your own choice as to um, how much value can I get in there? What, do I, what am I gonna need later in the day? That kind of thing. So numerical examples um, are that uh, something like internet ad auctions where all of us do this, you're on a website and you're reading a newspaper and an ad pops up. There's been an auction behind the scenes there and a choice was made and a lot of the companies have a fixed budget that they have to work with. So you wanna get as much value as you can in those ads. And my guess is value would be scored on the basis of how much it's like the customer that is watching the screen. Um, someone told me about a forestry service thing where they have only so much money to bid on land and they wanna try to get it. Or even um, a knapsack might be relevant in financial portfolios where you're trying to get your profit is gonna be the value and you have only so much budget. Although the modeling of that can get a lot more complicated. All right, we have a process for getting the Cubo. We're gonna to need to do that. And I'll talk a little bit about it here just cause it's fun before we get to the, uh, the results, but wanna maximize the total value of the selected objects. And again, the weight has to be less than W. So, the binary variables um, are, in this case, X shall represent for the ith object, is this thing in the, uh, in the knapsack or not? And we're gonna ask the quantum computer or the hybrid solver service to find a solution to tell us which objects end up selected for, which ones got in. It'll be one if the object is in the knapsack, and it'll be zero if it's not. So we need to write the objective. And um, again, encouraging those of you that don't have the immediate math thing here, send us questions, post to our community, please. And we can help you with these if these are bothering you. But what we wanna do is uh, the most, the, the sum of the values is just the sum over some letter alpha, some index. The value is the V and the Xs are the binary variables. And if I do this, if I get this right, it'll be as negative as possible. It'll be the most value I can get in that pack. Then I also try to do something where I write up the, see that thing in the parentheses there, W minus the sum of the weights times the Xs. What that is, is that is a constraint that the weights have to add up to the total weight W, like I mentioned a couple slides ago. And the A is what's called the Lagrange parameter, where it's a fudge factor. 
multiplies these constraints. The problem with this is that it isn't right. And the reason for that is that I didn't say that the total weight had to be exactly the same as the sum of the weights in the pack. The sum of the weights in the pack has to be less than or equal to the total weight, right? Like if I set 70 kilograms or something on the bag, that's a lot. But if I did, it, it could be 68. I have to allow for the possibility of it being under. And if you remember a Pokemon seminar from last summer, some of you might have seen it, you have to add what are called auxiliary variables, which handle the case of whether or not it's one less or two less or whatever. And so what happens here when you finally write this cubo out is that you have this thing Z and um, uh, basically Z is in the middle line there. And this is a little funny. Um, it's, it's a little complicated, but basically what you're doing is you're adding, see the Y, the Y eyes on the right are, are ones and zeros, and they're added in factors of two, and you're basically saying, as much as that's less than W, I will add these variables. And this algorithm is due to a, a fellow named Andrew Lucas, who was at Harvard University and wrote a influential paper six years ago where he solved a whole bunch of Cubo problems. And if you wanna see that paper, just type Andrew Lucas Cubo into Google and it will come up. Um, it's, a good, it's a good paper, but this is his algorithm. So we run this on a small set of objects. And so the objects are there in the table, the, uh, the weights there on the right and the values. And what happens is that when we do that, it chooses three of them, the 20, the 10, and the 15. And if you notice on the right, I set a maximum weight of 50, excuse me, that's actually on the left, but that's, notice that solution works, it's less than 50, and the energy in this case is minus 205, and the, again, as a check, if I take the 20 and the 10 and the 15 down here and add them, 70 plus 80 plus 55, I get 205. So I was kind of relieved when I got that. HSS did its job quickly. This is good. We've done this with other solvers. So of course, what I want to do is put this on a problem that's bigger that I cannot use other solvers with. So I generated one. And on the right here, in the, uh, in the upper part of the screen, you'll see the weights and the values. So that 96, that fourth line, that one's not a heavy object. It weighs 19 kilograms, but it's near the top. The value's maximum is 100, it turns out. So I want to combine all these things. And this is an example that you can actually download off the D-Wave examples repository. And HSS did a really good job on this. The maximum weight is 70. The solution that it came up with uh, it's hard to show you this, I realize, because I would have to put this whole table here. Oops, I would have to put this whole table here, and that would take up too much slide space. But the point is, is that the hybrid solver did a really good job, and the check was that when I matched it up with, like, I'm showing you here, the left, val the left is the value, 84 plus 78 plus 91 plus dot, 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 until the 10, the 92 line. They do add to 524. And one of my colleagues actually ran this problem on a different classical solution, a different classical algorithm, and proved that 524 was the best solution possible. So that was another cool thing when, uh, when he told me that. We are finding the best answer. If you run this, though, in the example, you're not going to get it every time, but, but you will. On, on some of the uh, some of the runs. All right, what's our analysis of this? This problem's too big to the QPU. We can't embed it, but it got used, which is cool. That's part of the point of the HSS. And we should really investigate 
whether the hybrid solver would find the optical optimal solution every time if I gave it longer run times. In other words, I talked about a minimum run time, but it might be worth a study if I crank that up to more seconds to see whether I'm going to get that 524 every time or not. All right. So in wrapping up, and I've got uh, one more thing after this that I mentioned, hybrid solver service is, is easy to use. It runs on big problems. Um, hopefully I've convinced you to give it a shot. We saw it do well on graph partitioning and knapsack, and I'm looking forward to finding out. One of the things that's cool about this job that I have is that um, I, I do something like this, and not that any of this has anything to do with me down the road by some number of months, but papers start popping up later where somebody's applied one of our uh, solvers to a problem. And it's, all, it's sometimes quite a shock. Things like um, much, much more complicated graph partitioning algorithms. Sue Minuski from Los Alamos National Laboratory is still working on that problem and cranking out uh, great results for at least three or four years now. And, and it, it's just exciting. These things come in all the time and somebody posts them and that's cool. So I'm hoping I got you motivated. Um, sign up for Leap. If you haven't, that's right there. That's uh, one minute free for a month. And then if you give us your GitHub ID, you can have uh, another minute for every month after. And as I always say, a minute is more than you think it is. Um, the problems run in milliseconds for a thousand reads, since a read is on microsecond order. So you can do very well with a, uh, with a minute. And that's my email if you want to reach out to me. But one more thing, and this is just a very fresh thing that just happened today. We've announced that we're going to give free access to LEAP for researchers and developers working on COVID-19 related projects. And uh, we're, we've also set up a community where customers and partners can provide expertise to each other in using the quantum computer and the tools. And we hope to help to find solutions to this crisis in partnership with people. I believe that 13 companies have signed on. And um, what I think is gonna be the most interesting thing here, at least to me, is the stuff that's gonna come out of these communities. Because I've already seen one conversation that already started. And um, we've all kind of suffered that the, the information we're getting is not always that consistent. And we need to do the research to see how our methods of controlling the, uh, the spread of it work. And I, I think D-Wave's going to play a role in it. And I hope I have motivated you as well. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, Joel. Uh, so we've answered many of the questions during the talk, but we have uh, quite a few that uh, our panelists have marked to be uh, asked aloud. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So this goes back to early in the presentation, Joel, where, where you were showing those two uh, performance graphs. And it says, what sizes of problems are we talking about in the previous graphs? How many qubits? I do not know. Um, the best thing there is to, Susan, I think the, um, the white paper is on our website. Sure, I think it probably, if you look under on the D-Wave website, uh, under resources and publications, there is a tab for D-Wave white papers. And I think that's where you can find it. Yeah, it's, so whoever asked that, thank you for that question. That's good. Um, make us tell you what the answer is. In other words, if it isn't in the document, then, then we can get it. You know, contact me if, if you don't get it from, from, the, uh, from the, um, the white paper. But I, I think it's in there. I think I forgot to put that on the, on the chart. Okay. Um, and moving a little farther down in the talk, why does the QPU time decrease with N? Uh, I believe, so that is a good question. And I believe that, and, and I, I've just, is, can you see my screen still? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's very significant. I think that's just sort of a, a, a happenstance thing. It, the, the, the best answer, the honest answer is, um, 
I don't know. It depends on how the solver is actually using the QPU. That's a choice uh, in there. But one thing I did observe that if I ran some of these more than once, those numbers are not all that consistent. In other words, somehow these solvers are finding their ways. That, that is, when I say these solvers, I'm thinking about the, the classical ones that the heuristics that have received these problems are finding ways to solve it uh, in different ways each time it's run. So I don't think that's that significant. Okay. Um, moving ahead a little bit, um, there was a slide that says, do you mean that we cannot be sure if the solution is optimal? That is right. Um, no probabilistic solver like this can ever really guarantee that the solution is necessarily the minimum energy. So yeah, let's talk about that for a moment. That came up with, uh, and I should say that's a very good question. That came up with the, uh, there it is, the uh, lowest energy solution in the knapsack. Um, what happened to me was when I started to run this, I was getting this 524 over and over and over again. And first I ran it on this 2015-5 where I knew what the solution was because I worked it out. And you start to trust it. And um, then I would get like 522, 519, 521, things like that. But there isn't really a proof. In other words, I think in tandem with some classical thing, you might be able to prove it, you know, or, or with some mathematical method. And I'm not remembering, um, I, I would have to ask the person that did the knapsack programming, but, but they essentially proved it. But no, I, I cannot do that in this case. Okay. And then there's sort of a follow-up question from someone else. So how do you evaluate the best solution we get from HSS to check how far it is from the optimal solution? Um, the way that I always evaluate solutions to a problem is first, does it satisfy the constraints? Does it, well, first of all, is it internally consistent? So a big thing for me is I do use the constant, as I mentioned before, uh, when I was doing this problem, the energy comes back from the solver and, and it looks like some funny number, but you can use the constant in the problem so that the energy comes back in something you can interpret. And I always set it as best I can, that is, on problems where I have some understanding of what's going to happen, because you don't always. But sometimes when you do, you, you try to set it to something that tells you Oh, I think it's reasonable. And, and part of the way that's built up is, um, you know, here's an example. Someone a few years ago wanted to talk about underwater detection of submarines by, by little uh, sonar detectors. Okay, they wanted to build a problem with like 30 detectors. And in what I tend to do is, let's start with one and one submarine, or a knapsack with four items, and a weight that's low enough where only one gets chosen, make some intelligent choice of small problem, make sure that it behaves, make sure you understand what's happening, and slowly turn it up. And, um, but again, I'm hedging on, the real question is, can you prove with a solver like this that you've got the lowest, and the answer is uh, no. It, 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 we do our best by post-processing, make sure it answers all the questions, the constraints are satisfied, the relationships are good. Does it make sense physically? You know, or, or if it's not physics, is it mathematical? In some way, do I use all the intelligence I have to somehow interpret it? And is it as good as I can get it? And my argument is that's not gonna be far away. Um, but there have been problems where that has not happened. Like I did do some financial modeling. And in that case, I didn't know what the energy was. And um, I didn't have long enough to work on that problem. So I guess my overall answer is I can't answer the, the, the real underneath that thing. Underneath that question is, can you prove it? 
no, but we do the best we can, and I think we can come a long way. Okay, next question. What is the substantive advantage to HSS over a high-powered classical computer? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think that that is going to show itself over time. It, it, in this case, so I think we have to divide that question up a little bit. Um, when we just compare a computer directly and we put a problem on it, the problems are always sort of set up to favor one or the other. You know, you, you kind of can't avoid it. And you try to compare on some generic problem as best you can. And there have been studies to do that based, you know, for the D-Wave in general or for other quantum computers. That's always the sort of the holy grail. Um, I think over time, as I mentioned during the talk, I'm hoping to see lots and lots of papers coming up in the next one to two years. And I think that it's going to get more and more competitive. Now, one that recently happened was that I studied was traveling salesman. A user wrote in recently and said, hey, I ran the traveling salesman on the hybrid solver and it didn't do very well. I compared it to Google uh, OR tools. And the answer to that really is those heuristics like the Google, the Google OR tools for traveling salesmen are very, very highly specific programs that have been tailored right for that problem. And those are going to be very hard to compete with no matter who you are. So I, I think the answer to that is my argument would be join us now. In other words, start using it and help us explore that question um, by running on something that, that gives it a, you know, in other words, let's make the HSS work really hard and see if it holds up as, as something. So far in my experience with it, it's done great. I've ran it on as many problems as I could since it got released. Okay, well, I think we've got time for one more. I know there's other questions in the chat that our panelists will try to quickly answer, but here's the last one we're going to uh, read out loud. On the hybrid front, what were the workflow variables and steps you had to write for this knapsack problem? Um, on the hybrid front, what were the workflow variables and steps you had to write? For oh, the um, in this case, the hybrid solver does that all for you underneath. In other words, I didn't do it. I, I used the, uh, the formulation of it here. I went this far. And then I, I basically wrote a Python program to implement this and I let the hybrid solver do it. So, it, so in terms of a workflow or anything like that in the hybrid solver, I, I didn't do it. In other words, the hybrid solver takes care of that for you. In the long run, what I would like to do, you heard me mention way back at the start, the, uh, the D-Wave hybrid framework. It would be a cool thing to come up with a framework for this problem and run it and compare it, but I haven't done that work yet. I hope that answers it. The, the, the things like workflow and, lay, and, and things like that are, are taken care of underneath the surface for you. Okay, well, I think uh, that is all we have time for today. I really appreciate everyone coming. Again, uh, we encourage you to go sign up for LEAP account. And if you're working on a COVID-19 related problem, please take a look uh, on the homepage of our website. There's a link to sign up for that. And uh, we hope everybody stay safe and we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Take care. Thanks.